Hi everyone, it's Jessel here. I hope you're well and safe amidst this corona COVID-19 outbreak. The global pandemic is amongst us. Um, To be honest, I could use it as an excuse and say that's the reason that this podcast was delayed from January, but it's not even slightly the the reason I'd just be lying through my teeth. But uh, now that this time is amongst us and uh, we all have kind of a bit more extra time at home and trying to stay healthy and stay within our habitats um there's been a bit more time now to kind of like get these podcasts ready and also more time for you to consume them so that i hope you are all good i hope you're healthy wherever you are in the world and staying safe so enjoy the podcast peace Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Transatlantic Rebels podcast with myself, Jessel, and Rashad. This time, we're talking about a recent film called Jojo Rabbit, and it was released... Well, okay, it was released in America ages ago, but we only just got it on New Year's Day in the UK. So, um, poor Rashad has been waiting for me to catch up on this film because he absolutely loved it. Um, So, yeah, it's... um, I mean, Richard, do you want to sort of just fill them in on, on basically like a non-spoiler kind of thing of, of, of what it's about and who it's by? Uh, basically, it's, uh, it's a movie, Jojo Rabbit, directed by a guy named Taika, Taika Waititi, who directed Thor Ragnarok, directed What We Do in the Shadows, um, Hunt for the Wilder People, Boy. Uh, it's basically, a, the simple the simple premise is, um, it's a, a boy named Jojo growing up as one of the Hitler youth in uh, in, uh, in Nazi Germany. And he and and he has a father who's off at war. He says he lives with his mom. His mom is just trying to do the best she can. And in order, and he struggles to get through the youth program. But he, his nature seems to be at odds with what the Nazis want him to be. In order for him to push through, he has a uh, an imaginary Hitler who represents his id. Yeah, that's pretty much. It. I mean. It's 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 also quite musical. It's quite overtly theatrical as well. I'd say it's very stylized. It's not like a sort of gritty, like you know, super like. It's not even like life is beautiful. I would I would say life yeah. is beautiful is like freaking Schindler's List compared to this film. So um, so yeah, it, it's it's a very fascinating one. I have to say, it's been extremely divisive in the UK. Like I, I was watching Mark Kermode now. Oh, oh my god! Oh my god! I couldn't believe it actually, because because uh, in America it seems like it's got you know generally yeah. quite consistent reviews, which are generally quite good. The odd one here or there, whatever. But here, wow! Um, I tell you what, what we'll do is we'll take a quick pause for the course and we'll come back with spoilers. Okay, we're back. So, uh, Taika Waititi, he's back. So, how many of his films have you watched now? I've watched. Um, I watched Boy. I've watched Humphrey Wilder People. I watched What We Do in Shadows, Thor Ragnarok, and uh, Jojo Rabbit. Okay, so I, I obviously I've watched Thor Ragnarok. We did a podcast on that. That was like my, I think it's still my favorite Marvel film, to be honest. Um, I've watched Boy as well. I didn't get a chance because I've been so busy to watch uh, What We Do in the Shadows and Hunt for the Wilder People, but they are on my mm-hmm. list, and I'm going to watch them in the next couple of weeks. Basically, cool. doesn't doesn't help this podcast. Sorry, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I've watched Jojo Rabbit now. There's there's so much to talk about because, like I said, the the um, the UK film community has uh, I have oh my god okay so gone to war yeah so there's there's um, one of there's Little White Lies one of my favourite kind of podcasts and they have a website and blah 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 and and they savaged it they absolutely savaged it and to, to the point where they're like saying that they thought Taika Waititi was going to be one of the sort of best directors of his generation they're going to have to completely reappraise everything he's ever done. I was like, what? fuck, fucking what? hell. What? Yeah, I was like, whoa. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, phew. yeah, there you go. 
I've just lost my chance to ever be on that podcast, but there you go. Please go, go on with that. Go on. I'm curious because your reaction, because I know at least over here, it's like 85 to 90% positive on that movie. But like I said, I was, I was, I was looking, I sometimes I go on Twitter and I, I, and I, and I search Good Trigger Rabbit to see how people respond to it. I see a lot of people on Twitter respond overly, they're fond of it. And then you see, like, I would say, it's like for every, 10 people that are fond of it. There's like two people. It's like, this is garbage or whatever like that. But it's like, it's like 10 to two. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the similar kind of odds that I'd seen until it got released in the UK. And then UK Twitter (laughs) seems to have a very different opinion. Well, not just UK Twitter. I mean, actual kind of film Twitter and film critics here. So I'm not quite sure why. Do you have any theories? Do you have any theories on that? Other than Twitter being Twitter and being too woke and I, I was thinking, being too politically the, correct, I don't know. Yeah. Well, maybe the only thing I, one thing I was guessing like is because the UK is closer to Germany yeah. than the United States is, and it's like a little bit more stingy. Like you should take this more. Because to me, I for me personally, I can't speak for other people. I thought the movie handled the subject matter well. I think for me, he made it clear what the point of the movie was. And I think he was making, we can get to that a little bit later. I think he was sending a message out to people like, especially for certain people, like, get over your hate. It's like, this is not the way to go or whatever like that. But I think I was, I was listening to something. It's like, well, he didn't take the Holocaust seriously, stuff like that. I'm like, but he wasn't focused on the Holocaust for this one. He was focused literally on the people who were in these towns who were, who, who were, who, who were dealing with, who were, who who switched over to this way of life? But we can talk about the de- particular details. Like he was focused specifically on them and how those kids were being indoctrinated into that situation. How these kids need to watch out and stuff like that. But I the only guess I had right now, considering the situation, because I thought it was going to be when I, when it came out over here, people were like raving about it. And then the first initial people who were on Twitter enjoyed it, and then they like said the critics the critics started getting split. And they're like, what the heck? I remember they had a 20-minute discussion on Mark Kerbo's show. He wasn't even on there. It was like the people who covered for him. And he was going at it with the with Edith Bowman. I think it was Robbie Collins. Edith Bowman. I think they were going at it, which she loved it. And she thought it was good for her kids to see and stuff like that. And he was like saying it was irresponsible, blah, blah, blah. And they were going at it with each other. I was like, wow. Yeah, the irresponsible thing, I don't get it. This is, this is kind of a film that works on multiple levels. You've got the, the kind of really kind of juvenile aspect to it which would speak to like a 12 year old basically and then and then it's very multi-layered i think it's the kind of film which you could watch as a 12 year old and then watch it every year for the next 20 years and then get something else and something else and something else from it but i i think maybe that kind of subtlety has been completely lost on a lot of people like uh, let me ask you a question do you think this is do you think this is the age because of twitter and everybody's so literal about everything do you think that people want stuff to be more didactic. Like, tell me this is wrong. Yeah. Like, tell me the way that, like, show the horrible. It's like, it's like, it goes back to the Joker thing. Like, people are like, well, the Joker's going to cause riots and people are going to start killing people in movie theaters. I'm like, guys, you, it's almost like you guys want this to happen. Like, why, why don't we wait for the movie to come out and then everybody have a discussion about it? It's like, it's every sponsor. I'm like, I remember back in the day when I was in film school, like you wanted films to be dangerous and challenge people. You wanted films not to be the same cookie cutter thing like everybody else and shove their, their, the, the moral of the story down your throat. You wanted to be a little bit more nuanced or different or a different kind of texture than we normally have it. Like I thought that's what we wanted as artists, but I don't know. The thing is, I will defend film critics here because, you know, speaking as a music critic, when I had to do like five albums in a week, yeah. How are you realistically going to get everything you need to? Like, you just do not have the time. And oh, I understand. And, and a lot of film critics, you know, they have to watch like one, two films a day, and and they get desensitized to certain things, and they just literally don't have the time in the day to do this. Plus, like, you know, they 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 maybe just get they don't have that time to soak up all the nuances of everything, basically. And and for me, like, that's not really the case. Like when it comes to films, so so I can have like more of a circumspect kind of relationship with films and taking the nuances that maybe they're missing. But also I think there's there's this kind of there's there's a climate right now. I mean especially here I'd say I mean you, you obviously you could speak more freely about America but here where I think the the kind of younger generation of film critics I'm noticing like especially the ones in their 20s and I really don't mean to be like sound like some you know grumpy old okay guy, boomer <laughs> okay boomer they they are they are basically taking certain things and just running with it and and they and in 
in the process just missing the wider point of almost everything and they're fixating on certain things like one of the one of my most hated phrases yeah and i'm really careful not to use it myself unless it's really necessary is is the word problematic and problematic is bandied around so much right now right and you and i like i've said this before you know we're both like relatively liberal or feminist or, or whatever the this progressive yeah we're very progressive both of us right and and we're I, prag- I think we're pragmatic progressives yeah uh, but also, I feel like I'm the kind of person, I can't speak for you, but I'm the kind of person who's got more progressive the older I get, right? But there are limits to that. And it's kind of like, you've got to be realistic in life as well. And and also just try and look at the various aspects, put yourself in someone else's shoes, try and understand the multiple levels of what someone is trying to do, right? And clearly, uh, this this is like a multi-layered film, you know, you could look at it and say, oh, this is irresponsible. Why is there a depiction of Hitler as this kind of like fluffy person, blah, blah, blah. That's part of artistry. And would, yeah. Also, did you miss that bit, his kind of bit at the end where he goes absolutely apeshit and he goes into full Hitler mode where he's screaming at little boy, right? And there's no like laughs. So he doesn't play that for laughs. He's sneering. He's like, that whole monologue at the end is is really coming that's like full Hitler. That's not like, you know, 12 year old fluffy imaginary friend thing, right? No, no one talks about that. <laughs> that, that just gets skirted this over. Saying, this movie is like I said. Like I said, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I'm not trying to take anybody's opinion away from you. I can only go by the movie I saw, and I'm like, this movie should be more. Talk- this movie should be one of the most talked about movies of the year. I mean, it, it, in certain circles, it is. I'm talking about in, in a general public. I mean, it is nominated. I mean, even though I don't care about Academy Awards, at least the Academy acknowledged it as one of the best pictures of the year, which I 100 percent think it is. I don't believe in a, a best picture, but I think. I always think in tiers, like there's terrible movies, average movies, decent movies, good movies, great movies, and there's like the movies that have been remembered for whatever, for, that should be remembered later on. And I think this is one uh, on that top tier. I'm like, we were talking, I was, I think I was, I was tweeting somebody. I was like, I'm shocked that there's a lot more pushback from the critical community on it to a certain extent, but I, I would understand it from like the mainstream or can understand the people who go in and go out. But I'm like, this is very, to me, like, this is very nuanced and well thought out. And I'm like, I, I watched the movie and I think Taika Waititi took this, took this movie. He, cause he's, cause because he's a humorous guy and a comedian guy, he took it seriously. I, when I watched the movie, I, I see a guy who took this movie seriously and thought about everything he wanted to say about that situation in this movie. And I think he just wanted, he came from the angle of, he wanted to pull people out of their hatred and not fall for propaganda. Hitler in that movie represents the propaganda that goes to, that affects these little boys and these people like that. He go he he said it, he said something interesting at the beginning of the movie. He's like, they treated Hitler like a rock star. The movie is like it's like Dad, I want to hold your hand in German, and like they treated Hitler like like a rock star. And that's that indoctrination that he did over him. He had that sway over them. It's like he's this 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 figure that had to sway over these people, and you have to break out. You have to find some way to break out of that bullshit. That's what the message of that movie is. And like you said, the, as he goes to the movie, Hitler is childish and he's like his friend and blah, blah, blah. And then more, the more and more he understands the Jewish girl, the more he pushes against the propaganda. And the propaganda starts coming at him harder and harder and harder until he has to push that propaganda away himself. He had to make the choice to push that away from him. You can't... It, you, you can have people tell you all the stuff you want, but you have to make the choice to break free from that propaganda. The harder and then the harder you, the harder your brain pushes against that, the harder that propaganda is trying to go into your brain. And he had to make the choice to do that. And I think that the narrative arc of the boy and, like you're saying, the propaganda is very well handled as well. To be honest, I, you know, I don't think it, it lacks sensitivity or anything like that. And and it. I think each stage can be explained properly. It's not as if like it's just random and and like you know he's just trying to make a laugh out of it. He's all. It also bears mentioning that he his grandfather is Jewish and he goes by his mother's maternal name sometimes, like Taika Cohen. Yeah, he you know and and uh, it's really strange because a lot of the criticism I've seen from critics who aren't even Jewish. Yeah, and and they're like, well, on behalf of the Jewish community, it's like, you're what? not even Jewish, and it's just like, you know, it'd be like me trying to do that. I'm not Jewish, for fuck's sake, like Jesus Christ, like, no, not Jesus Christ, but you know what I mean. Like, it's just, it's just crazy, and I think that's his just- story. That's his story to tell. He's a Jewish person. That's his story to tell. I like me telling the Indian not you, you, I can't, you can't tell a story like that. Yeah. I'm like you, it's like for example, if, if, if a black movie comes out, like everybody's entitled to criticize anything. Let's be real, but. 
you can't say on behalf of the black community. That's a discussion between that community. If Indians have an issue with a movie, then that's the discussion between, uh, even though I'm 10% Indian, but you know how that goes. But you can, you, that's this, you can't say on behalf of another culture, then that's where I have, that's where I, I get frustrated with liberals sometimes. Don't get, don't start doing it. Don't start doing that. I'm offended for your culture. I'm like, listen, there's different voices in our culture where we all don't think the same way. Same way with Indians, same way with, Chinese, Japanese, any culture, Jewish culture. There are people who, there are people, there's a, there are people who think that, um, Seinfeld is blackface for Jewish people. There's Jewish people who don't like Seinfeld. They think that's mocking their culture. Wow. That's what I'm trying to say. There's so many, there's so many different groups. Like there's people like the same thing with the, with the black community. There's people who think there's, I saw a tweet the other day that people was like, I don't know why people are praising Wakanda. That's not good. That's, that's selling black people, um, work short. I'm like, Nobody who's an irrational adult thinks Wakanda's real. It's a fantasy, like Superman, like Batman. It's like they're they're showing you like this is how, this is the potential that you can have as being a desert. And even Black Panther, they showed even in that movie in Black Panther, they showed that there was a there was a downside to Wakanda that they they were so in, they were so shut off in the rest of the world that they avoid doing the right thing, and they, somebody got hurt for it. They created a monster. It's like there's nuance to these stories. That people need to let it breathe a little bit and not go, well, this is irresponsible. It's evil. I'm like, guys, I understand you don't like the movie. You have a problem with it. But the hyperbole is where I start getting frustrated with with people sometimes. Like, you can say you don't like the movie and then go out there. But to say, like, you want to reevaluate somebody's whole filmography, I'm like, what? Come on, guys. Yeah, it's not good enough for me in terms of like, you know, the the reactions that the thing is that you've got to explain your your sort of, you know, dislike of something as well. It can't just be, oh, I didn't like it. That's, yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly, yes. anyone could. That's just like that's barely even an opinion. That's just like a feeling um, in terms of the. So actual, let me ask you. Oh, go on. Go on. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask you. So, so what were so what were the future things that that impressed you about it? Yeah, yeah, I was just coming to that. I mean, to be honest, you, okay. you mentioned one of the um, one of the things I loved, which was actually the opening of using the Beatles in German, which was just genius. That was actually one of the best opening sequences I've ever seen to any film, to be honest. And it just kicked. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Like, so what was so what was going through your head when you first saw that? Like, what would you when you first sat there and it came up? What were you? What was your response to it when you were sitting there looking at it? Well, I mean, first of all, you're kind of like well. Uh, immediately I was like hang on the Beatles weren't around you know you're trying to do the maths and you know it right it, you, obviously you know the Beatles weren't around in freaking World War Two, but you're like uh, uh. <laughs> and then you're like oh okay I see what he's okay is this just ra-? and then he's like splicing it with Hitler and you're like okay this is really clever really clever you know you've got Beatle mania juxtaposed with Hitler mania and and you know it's just genius I, I, just, I just think it it gives this levity to the film as well from the off right and it sucks you into this false sense of security and it gets you to this kind of childlike state so I think the genius of the film is is that you're and it's one of the things that again people have criticized that we don't want to harp on it too much we want to focus on the positives but people have said oh it, it it's too much of an infantilized film or whatever basically it's too juvenile but the thing is is that you have to put this is being told through the perspective of 12 year old boy and and the thing is 12 year old boys are, are probably amongst the easiest people to manipulate on earth if you're like hitler or, or whatever you know the whole hitler youth i've mentioned it before on this podcast that you you really should go and read this book. Um, what's his name? William Shire. And it's it's um, called The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And it's about how Hitler got to power. And it's super long. It's like the audio book is 58 hours, right? So it's really good value for money. But like I read that just before Donald Trump was. And, and so I was like, yeah, Trump's getting in power. <laughs> He's just following this playbook, right? So mm-hmm. this was in the beginning of 2016. I read this and so now four years ago. And it's just such a good book. And it details so much of like what is in this film. But the really interesting thing I find about this film is that it's such, it's like the tail end of the whole thing, right? So you have all these people who are giving the impression of like, yeah, this is what the status quo is to this 12 year old boy. But then when he's not looking or not noticing, then not to camera, but to the kind of like wider world. They're kind of like, yeah, we don't give a shit about this war thing anymore. We just want it over. Yeah, clearly we're losing the war. Clearly this is, you know, the, the tide is turning. You know, who cares about this kind of stuff anymore? And um, and what's his face? It, well, oh, Christ, I forgot his name. Sam Rockwell. That's it. So his character, I thought was fascinating. And, um, and like, you know, clearly he's supposed to be homosexual or at least 
transvestite i don't know and uh, no i think it's homosexual with uh with Al- homosexual yeah, yeah with uh alfie, alfie Al- 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 yeah and yeah. um and but he he's kind of like a, a sympathetic character, and he could be like, "Well, there shouldn't be any sympathetic Nazis." Blah 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 blah. And and okay, again, missing the point. Nuance, it's nuance, just, because he's not. They're not justifying. This is what I say. They're not justifying Nazism. But you can't think that every single person in the in, in the Nazi party and who in Germany were drinking the Kool Aid. Some people had to adapt to that to survive. Now you now now you're not excusing the actions of what they did. You're not excusing that. What he's showing is this: these are there were there, there were people like JoJo, there were people like Samuel Sam Marvel characters, there were people like Stephen Merchant's character. Like there, he shows the different degrees of people who were in the Nazi party. Some were some were a hundred percent gung ho. This is what we are. Some people were like, you know, we just got to do this because this is where the country's going. And we got to go along with this. It's not too uncommon, like what's going on in my country right now. I tell people this all the time. I always put Anakin Skywalker. I was like, people people get mad about the character Anakin Skywalker, and I go, we got people in cage, we got kids in cages dying right now. What did Anakin Skywalker do in Return of the Revenge of the Sith? He killed kids in the name of security. What are we doing right now? Kids are dying in the name of security. So we're not too far from this stuff. Jojo Rabbit is the, the, the same stuff keeps happening over and over again, and this is going on right now. There are people in my country who are Trump supporters. There are people who aren't. There are people in the Republican Party who aren't Trump supporters, but they're going along with it because they're Republicans. It's the same stuff happening right now. I completely agree. And I actually made this point on Twitter. I was like, this is this is incredibly timely, this film, because of Trump and, and not just Trump, but, you know, in Brazil, in parts of Europe. Um, in, Fascism. In India as well. I mean, don't want to incur the wrath of Indian Twitter. But right now, the far right and the right are, are on the rise in multiple locations in the world. And they have been now for about half a decade, at least. So it, you cannot turn a blind eye and think, OK, you know, another thing <laughs> I, I, I keep. Oh, God, I need to just delete my Twitter account. But someone was saying, why do films like 1917 and Jojo Rabbit have to be made? You know, these are stories that have been told ad nauseum. I was like... This is not the time to be making that point when the right is just rising all over the world. Yeah, this is literally the time to be making more of these films to say that is really bad. You know, no, you know what George Lucas said about about when he made Star Wars and pretty much the the, the Empire's the Nazi Party. He was like, you have to keep telling the same story because human beings keep making it. Human sometimes, sometimes people on Twitter they think that we already moved on from stuff. We didn't move on from stuff. We literally had white we had we had white guys wearing polo shirts with tiki torches talking about life is unfair for them. We literally had that a couple of years ago in America for crying out loud. You have that. You have you have people who are you have people in my in my country. You have cops who are who are doing Nazi signs or not? They have Nazi regalia and stuff like that. I'm like guys, this stuff is still happening. It's like it's like it's like Germany themselves. Germany Germany does their best not to have that stuff, but like the like the white swastikas and stuff like that. Because you shouldn't do that. That shouldn't be. That should not be promoted. It should not be. And you have to remind people of that it's going on right now. So for people to say that, well, we learned this already. It's, it, what's that? What's that saying? Those the, those who don't understand history are doing to repeat it. Yeah. Don't remember it. And we're doing it right now. It's not over. It's literally happening right now. And you got to pull your head out of the sand and look at it that way. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, if we kind of kind of go back to the Hitler Youth aspect of it as well, in the book, I remember it, it was saying that basically, I mean, for, for the boys and the girls had wildly different experiences of Hitler Youth camps, right? So basically, and it's kind of reflected in this film that the boys get taught to you know freaking kill rabbits and and blow shit up and this and that and la la la. la. And the women basically, okay, sorry, the girls are like, oh, you know, here, you learn how to sew and how to get pregnant. And actually, the amount of, um, in real life, in the in the Hitler youth camps, the amount of pregnancies that came from it, where girls got raped constantly, there was a first sexual experience, they didn't understand it. And like the amount of children that were born from these things is shocking, like unbelievable. It was such a, and that it was referenced in the film was such an amazing moment for me because I was sitting there watching it. I was like, I can't believe that they just snuck that in so cleverly about the girls getting pregnant thing because it's so true, but no one ever talks about this kind of stuff. Because they're the surface, they're looking at the surface level of it. Like I said, it, I'm not everybody has like a movie that we're not arguing that right there. We're just saying, and you said, like you said, we're defending critics. It's like you see a bunch of things. So and it's like, it, it, but also I always keep in mind being an uh, English major is that sometimes certain things 
don't get appreciated until later on. And I think this is going to be one of the things that once the initial frustration cools down and people start actually looking at it for what it is, I think it's going to be very appreciated. For me, it's my favorite movie of the year. It may not be somebody else's, but that's okay. But I look at that movie, I'm like, I know in my heart, I only watched it one time and I got a lot of something. I was like, I know that if I, when I watch it, when I get it on Blu-ray or something like that, I watch it again, I'm going to see so many different details. Taika is a guy for me. Same thing he did with Thor Ragnarok where he was doing the same thing where, where um he stuck, he snuck into colonialism about that stuff right there and um Valkyrie getting drunk, how um the natives in um in uh New Zealand they were getting drunk because it was so painful reliving their past about these people coming in and slaughtering their people, this and that. It's like they have to drink to get through the day and stuff like that. So it's like Taika is the guy where he he's the guy you want to be in doing these pop cultural movies. Him and Ryan Coogler where they put in these perspectives and make it relevant. Make they make it quote unquote fun. But at the same time, they're putting relevant themes and concepts into these movies. It's not just, wow, look at these things crashing and bashing. This is funny. Uh -huh. They're actually saying something meaningful. And this, is this a thing that we want in these blockbuster movies? We Do we want to go back to the 90s where it's like 100% fluff? It's just Michael Bayisms all day long. Do we want to go back to that? Come on. Hey, man. Bad Boys for Life is coming out tomorrow, actually, over here. <laughs> Um, mm. And there's no Michael Bay attached, and apparently it's quite a decent film now. <laughs> so gotcha. Apparently the directors have done a good job; like they were like a bit more sensitive about things. Um, I tell you what, let's let's kind of like go through some of the cast members and characters, okay. and, and sort of see what we all think. So Roman Griffin Davis as uh, as Jojo Rabbit as Johan. Um, how do you think he did? Fantastic. If you watch Taika's um, bodies of work, um, he usually works with kids a lot. He is very gifted at finding excellent child actors. And he carried that movie. Like it's he's in a lot of that movie. And he carries it. He has the, the nuance. He has the happy, sad, he's humor, he's funny, he's angry, he's frustrated. He goes through the proper gamut of a three-dimensional human being, which is incredible. Not many I mean, th there's like kid roles like you see like a like a Macaulay Culkin or like a Haley Joe Osment or um Dakota Fanning. Like you if you see those actors. But if you watch Taika's movies, like he's very good at getting those strong performances out of kid actors. So I give him high marks for that little boy carrying that movie right there. He did it all for me personally. Yeah, I think he was brilliant. And and the thing is, is that it's not just um, a kind of child role. The way that Taika actually frames the um, the the sort of cinematography frequently is really kind of like in your face shots where there is nowhere to hide for an actor, and they they're face is literally taking up the whole screen yeah and um and that's this the the case with roman griffin davis and also thomas and mckenzie as well who plays Elsa. oh my god yeah and, and she was unbelievable i was like she was the one i got home i was like where oh, i need to see another film of hers or whatever i'm going to keep an eye on her because she was just fantastic yeah i mean mm -hmm. she was my by far my favorite character in the film mm -hmm. um but he did a brilliant job and i saw something really sad today like he was kind of like on Instagram, he was like, oh, thank you to everyone, blah, 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 for all the praise, I'm really happy, blah, blah, blah despite my teeth and stuff. And, and everyone was like, oh, my God, this kid's, like, fi already fixating on his, you know, teeth and stuff. And, like, you know, the kid's beautiful. The kid's a beautiful little boy. He's just happy and he's such a good actor. Just be, be you know, don't go fucking child don't actor crazy them. shit. Do you know what I mean? You know like, what? I, if, I, if I was a parent, I would have my kids not go on social media. Exactly. I agree completely. Especially if, oh, my God, especially if they're, like, a child star or something. But, you know, th this is the thing. This is the world that they're growing up in. And it, it it's it's kind of you just hope they have a network around them right supporting them and, and sort of sheltering yes. them at least a little bit you know um i mean thomas and mckenzie uh is kind of what she's like 18 19 something she's a new zealander i thought she was incredible <laughs> as elsa I and mean, really if you're talking about like i don't think anyone carried the film like particularly but i think for me it's an ensemble yeah yeah for me she was like really the the I think I think if Roman Roman was the heart of it, I think she was the soul of it, really. And okay. and she kind of like turned his entire life around from this this little boy who's be believing all the propaganda into someone who has to fend for themselves and who has gone on this real journey. And she's the one who subtly, subtly, subtly just directs him and sort of you know plays along with him when she has to. And and sort of you know holds him by the, takes him by the hand when when she has to and and I just think it, I don't know if she got a nomination but she fucking should have Jesus Christ like mm. I mean amazing so I don't know what you thought of her oh no I thought she was incredible like I said for for me I, I'm going to repeat the same thing over and over again with this cast like I think there was another movie before I can't remember the name of it. I, I swear they had it in my head I just took notes but um 
But there was another movie before this where people was like, she was the one to keep an eye out on right there. I think it's Leave No um, Trace. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she's another one. Like, she's like, it's like, it's like her and Florence Pugh is like, they're, that those are names keep coming up, like the one to watch as they're going up. Um, so she's like considered in, in, in on that scale where it's like they're doing this incredible work for people so young. It's ridiculously incredible. Like their skill level. I mean, Florence Pugh done a little bit more than she did, but they're still along the range of like those up and comers where people are keeping their eye on and stuff like that. No, I thought it was personally, I thought it was a two hander where it was like um, those, both of them were bouncing off each other, giving each other, they were, they, they, then, and the more you got to know them left and right, the more they gave each other strength like there. The casting, if there's, if there's another thing Taika is, I'm a Taika fan. If I go to, if there's another thing Taika is good at, he's good at casting ensembles. Like I've yet to see it for me personally, because he's seen pretty much all Taika movies. I've yet to see a Taika movie where his casting, the whole cast is impeccable. There's not, I, I've not seen a weak link in any of his movies yet. And this is no question at all at as well. And sometimes he does something where, um, he'll play to, uh, he'll play to an actor's strength. And then just like tweak it just a little bit and make it seem new. Like, okay, I never seen that part of that actor. Even though that actor's used for doing a certain thing, he'll tweak it and then flip it over like he did for Chris Hemsworth. Sometimes, like, he'll say, okay, I see. If I pull that part out of you, I'll, I could make you a lot stronger. And from what I read from how he does his set, he makes sure his set is fun. He makes sure that when people come to set, there's no, there's no reason why Christian Bale wants to do it, be the next door movie. Because everybody, the word around Hollywood is Tyka's Tyka's the guy you want to go to, and I think he's going to be that guy where it's going to be. I'm going to laugh at people who are like, "Yeah, I'm going to." He needs to reevaluate his whole body of work. I think if Tyka keeps going the way he's going, he's going to be one of them guys where um, you're going to be like, "Where were you at when you met that dude right there?" I think he's going to be that guy. Him and him and Kugler and Lulu Wang and this this whole generation of of um of directors around our age, like the forties, like early forties, late forties. There's this whole entire generation of us that I think they're going to be that new, even though, even though people want to say like, you know, like back in the seventies, like Spielberg, Coppola, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. I liked him. But the difference between our generation of directors and their generation is, and it's not a racist, but though they were considered great because they were all a bunch of white guys, but now you're getting this whole group of people where it's like different cultures, different people, Women, men. It's like you got Kate Shortland doing Black Widow. You got Chloe Zhao doing Eternal stuff like that. You got all these people coming out that are doing this stuff, and it's going to be that whole new. There are directors where we don't like like worship these directors, but they're bringing the artistry of filmmaking, and they're exposing other people to other ways of thinking. Finally, not just this one way of thinking. They're also telling different stories or they're yes. telling the same stories in new reimagined ways. Like even I'd, I'd include Greta Gerwig in that as well, because the yes, women's absolutely. been done six times before and she's done it in a completely different way, which is new, interesting and fresh for, for this generation. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with what you say. Um, if we can sort of go back to the cast, the next one I was mm-hmm. going to be the next one. We might have contrary thoughts on Scarlett Johansson uh, mm-hmm. as, as Jojo's mother. I think she did a, really good job um with some interesting twists but i i don't know if i mean i don't know if she sort of like i don't know if that's like a legendary role for her or anything like that or i don't i think you know there could have been another actress doing it for me perhaps like um i think she's maybe the only one where i was like yeah yeah it's good it's good <laughs> kind of thing as, as a person um, obviously yeah i thought she was great yeah yeah. Okay. Can you can, can kind of like not that you have to convince me, but can you sort of illuminate why? No. I mean, I mean, because 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 normally because normally she's the the straight the straight man. Normally she's normally she's like either either she's like for example like going back to Lost Translation, she's either like an ingenue or she's um or she's a serious straight person or she's kind of like the um like the object of of the object of affection. But it's the first time you've really seen her like play the mom role. And it's the first time you've seen her be like, like heartwarming and humorous. Like you've never, like if you think about how many how Scarlett Johansson roles have you seen her in that she was considered a heartwarming character. Even in even in um, Marriage Story where she's has a kid right there, she's not even she's not really heartwarming in that one. No. She's more like t- typical. She's more like typical Scarlett Johansson where she's like she's like the thing with Scarlett Johansson is she has the looks, but she also has like the acting chops. But in this, but there's um, 
I also I, I have a theory sometimes about when people don't like her roles as much or don't give her the props she deserves. It's almost like you. This is my theory. I mean, I'm not saying towards you, but I think for some people, I think like you look at her and you see her life and you assume that she gets everything she wants. So you really can't connect with her. Like she's 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 the gr- she's the girl that every every like red blooded male would want to have sex with automatically. It's very hard. I find it very hard to see any guy that if they had the opportunity to bang her. So I'm sorry, I'm bringing my '90s guy out there to have sex with her. Let me be pretty <laughs> correct. <laughs> let, let, let me let me do it that way. Um, unless you're happily married with your wife and you're loyal with your girlfriend, I mean, maybe those guys wouldn't do it. But if she comes to the room, you're going to take that. So I think because she has that thing going on, I think sometimes people don't give her, give her the credit she deserves. Sometimes, but for me, I haven't seen her do a heartwarming role or like the scene where she's like um. With uh, when she acts like when she acts like his dad and her at the same time, I've never seen her do something like that before. All the roles I've seen Scarlett Johansson do in her period of time, I've never seen her do heartwarming mother role and actually like go, okay, you know, she's not the ingenue, she's not the hard, she's not an active star, she's not the, the the object of affection you can't reach. That was a different part of her that you've seen right there, and I bought that she was the mom, and I bought that she loved her um her son, and I bought that she'd be the type of person that would go against Hitler. And, and rebel against that and then suffer for that. Like, she was willing to do that. Like, I bought all that stuff like that. And I've never seen her do a role like that. So, for me, looking at her, for for me, looking at her, the role she did, she did Black Widow, which is a totally different character. She did the the the, the wife and Marriage Story, which is a totally different character. And she did this role, which is a completely different character. So, for me, personally, that showed that she has more range than what most people give her credit for. So, that's why I was mostly, I, I was impressed by it. I mean, that's the way I look at it anyway. I would just like to say, I don't really fancy Scarlett Johansson. She's just not my type. But like, so so it's interesting that you say like, you know, like any guy out there would kind of like, you know, have sex with her or whatever. I mean, she, not to be crude about it, but she's just not my type. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I obviously think she's a very good actress. Mm-hmm. I, I think you're really you hit the nail on the head to be honest she's never really had a role like this before um i would argue that she has had vocal roles perhaps where where there's a lot more nuance and she can kind of express herself vocally um something like her she's the voice of the os in there which is and she nails it in that actually um and that goes back to my argument of the opposite object effects yeah if you take away the visuals then and just Mm -hmm. listen to the voice and she she's actually got a, a bizarrely She's one of these people that expresses herself um, vocally in in films with where she doesn't have a visual role really well. She's fantastic, actually. But then suddenly, sometimes on screen, she doesn't, and it's kind of weird. I, I don't I don't always get that feeling from her in every film. But obviously, like you know, people have different different kind of peaks and troughs. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but in here, I, th- I thought. What I really liked about her performance was that she was playing up to the 12 year old. Like, you know, so many of the kind of, she was trying to buoy his spirit and all this kind of stuff. And, and kind of like, you know, it's, it's a difficult role because it wasn't fleshed out beyond the gaze of a 12 year old child, right? You didn't really see her doing lots of other stuff. You didn't see her in a resistance, like at resistance meetings, you know, all this kind of stuff being a grown up. And, and you, you, see her through the male gaze of those soldiers who are returning who see her when she's on the bike you see her through the gaze of a 12 year old and then you see her die basically and it's just like i'm not laughing at like ha 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 it's just like it's just that was a really that was the biggest shock moment of the whole film to be honest and and although it's kind of predictable i knew it was going to happen i didn't the way that they did it was beautiful actually that was like one of the best moments of the film um with the butterfly and stuff so uh, in terms of, the, I'm not saying that it was bad. She was bad or anything like that. I think she was good, absolutely. But it was just, it was just an interesting role. That was like the one counterpoint to, to kind of the, the rest of the film, which I think was brilliant. Like something like Stephen Merchant in this film, it was so good as that Gestapo agent, like absolutely brilliant. Like he could have been in in the Indiana, Indiana Jones films, maybe. Like, oh, of course, like, that's where yeah. I, that's where I put myself. Yeah. And then if you look at someone like Rebel Wilson, um, I mean, she's just Rebel Wilson, <laughs> basically being oh, yeah. being like ultra ditzy um and i actually thought 
I, I think there was so much levity to what she to, to the film. I think she's really like one of the biggest comic reliefs of it, like consistently throughout. Um, I don't know. What did you think of Rebel Wilson's character? Because some people it kind of rubbed, no. rubbed people up the wrong way a little bit. No, I was fine with her. I'm like, I didn't really focus her on as much. She was like just a tertiary character. Yeah, but um, I had a problem with her. And um, and then Sam Rockwell. No, he was fine. Like Tom, Sam Rockwell, Sam Rockwell. He's been doing that role, and he gets you everyone to sleep. I mean, the only difference with with he 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 can. He's been doing that role for a long time now. So that's that's that. I mean, he, and he's good. Sam Rockwell's good being Sam Rockwell. Um, the last time I seen him change it up was maybe Moon. Yeah, maybe that's is true. that that's true. right there. I mean, the, the the big thing with this one is is that um he showed a little bit more heart than he normally does. Because normally Sam Rockwell's normally like he's detached. He's kind of like the like the smart ass. He's kind of like the the asshole. But you, like I said, he pulled like Takawatiti pulled out that heartwarming thing. So when you see him at the end taking a shot for um for a uh, Joja, um you buy that. And normally you don't see Rock, Sam Rockwell do that. Yeah. Thing. Sam Rockwell is usually like an asshole, and if he does show any kind of like contempt, there's always like a like a, a snark or kind of like uh, um, I'm not going to I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of showing you that I give a crap. I think he's been one of the best on screen villain villains since like. You know the Green Mile in 1999. Like he's just awesome oh, cornbread. Oh my god, he's just brilliant. Like uh, I just, uh, it must be so great to make a career out of just being an asshole on screen and just getting paid for it. It's just, just awesome. But uh, in this, yeah, I agree. I think he's fantastic. I think it, his his is one of the most kind of nuanced ones where from the start you know there's something a bit different about him and then layer by layer it's just peeled away until the end. Oh yeah. You know? Um, mm-hmm. and then finally, I mean, there's not really. Anyone else? I mean, you could. Oh, I don't really want to talk about his best friend uh, Yorkie, but but Taika Waititi as Adolf <laughs> Hitler, we have to talk about. So, um, I mean, for, for for first of all, I have to say he looked so much like him. I couldn't believe it because everyone, all the reviews were like, "Oh my god, he looks nothing like him." Blah blah, and I was like, "Freaking heck, he what? looks just like Adolf Hitler, like scarily so." Like I couldn't believe it, and this wasn't with the prosthetics of like Nicole Kidman and Charlize Theron that they and he didn't even change his skin tone. He didn't, he didn't even do anything. Like he just literally <laughs> grow a fucking mustache, grease your hair, and he's Adolf Hitler. I could not believe it. Like, mm-hmm. oh, brilliant. I mean, what what do you think? How do you think in terms of both his always does, but also wh- like whenever, how how he imagined Hitler? I've I've never seen Tiger go that dark. Even in, okay. The last time I seen Tiger even get, even get closely dark is what we do in Shadows when he's a vampire and then like he's the, he's like the he's like the fae vampire. He's like, oh, I'm all courteous and fastidious and I let to keep my house clean. And then once you see him become a vampire, it's like he's wicked. And it's like when he goes full on Hitler, like that's some dark stuff, yeah, man. Yeah. That's dark. They always say comedians have a dark side. It's like he pulled that dark side out and showed it right there. Like to me, I think that Hitler that he plays is like the way he's playing him. That's Tiger's social commentary on Hitler. That's his final world, Hitler. Everything that he does with Hitler throughout time of movies, like, this is how I feel about Hitler. I'm going to show you how I feel about Hitler. This is what he is. He's childish. He's pedantic. He's evil. He's hateful. He's not somebody to worship. He's like, he's just terrible. He's terrible. And I like the fact that he does it that way. Like, he doesn't, people say, you trying to say, somebody say he tried to glorify me, Hitler. Like, he's talking to me, he made a point in an interview. He was like, like if you think about the if you think about the Third Reich, if you think about how the way they dress, what they thought about, what their belief system is, it's ridiculous. It's childish. It's a fourteen year old boy's fantasy. Of course, a fourteen a, a kid's going to want to do that because it's the illusion of power. It's big. It's, it's men who are powerless who suddenly get some power and they and they blow stuff out of proportion. Hitler was an angry man that wanted power. He achieved it and he went off the deep end. That's not leadership. That's insanity. That's a little. That's a little boy's power fantasy right there. That's not something to worship. Like, of course, little kids are like, oh, yeah, I want to be powerful. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's one of these films. I think in general, Jojo Rabbit is one of these films. The more I think about it, the more I love about it, to be mm. honest. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I think we kind of maybe differ. Like, it wasn't, I don't think it was like a 10 out. Like, for me, it was like an 8 out of 10. And I just thought it was really good. And I got pretty much everything it was trying to do. And maybe if it came on TV, I'd kind of leave it on. But I wouldn't, like, rush back to watch it for a second or third time. 
Um, but loads of people I know have, and they absolutely adored it. Um, I just think it was a really, really well done film. Um, and I, I'm more interested to kind of sort of check in periodically every sort of five years and see what the kind of like take on it is and, and see how it kind of progresses. So that's, that's the kind of like situation for me. I mean, you said that it was your number one film of, of 2019. Oh, yeah, without question. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that, that is, there is no higher praise really than that. Um, I I just think it, what what I'd really like to know is is if there's any of the listeners if they've taken like their kids to see it because I I did read about um uh, about one um well it's actually one Jewish guy wrote a, a, an article and said that he'd taken his I think his like 12 year old son or something to see it and it was really fascinating sort of seeing what the 12 year old thought about it um so uh, yeah I mean there's I think this is the kind of film there's going to be so many different takes and stuff on it and um so part of that is what you were alluding to before is this generation of directors are amazing at, at multi-layering their films and getting lots of talking points out of them you know like this this is the kind of film we could talk about this for ages and ages and pick like micro moments from it and all this kind of stuff we've barely kind of like really delved into any of like oh, no, on-screen moments you know because there's so much else to talk about there's so many fascinating things to talk about and i i do think you know, to the people who are saying, well, why do we need to make these films? Yeah. Because this shit keeps happening again and again and again. Yes. You know, and and people do not learn their lesson. And <sighs> when is it going to stop? It's not going to stop in, in the foreseeable future. So you need films like yeah. this. Art influences people. And, and like, if anything, this film is showing you that the 10-year-old or 12-year-old, however old he's supposed to be, he thinks he's on this path, right? And and like he believes all of this stuff, and gradually he gets influenced by a really effective, trusted source who shows him that no, there is another side to this life, and gradually he comes through the other side, you know. And if anything, like I see some of the people on Twitter, or I see far right people, or this or that, who who need their own personal guide to to get them out of yes. this hellhole that they're in right now, right? And anything that art can do to influence them in the positive way, fucking do it. Just do it. Just, just stop complaining. Let people just make the art, yeah. Absolutely. You might not agree with every aspect of it, and it might not be woke enough for you, and it might not be perfect, and blah, blah, but just let people do something, you know. <sighs> Here's some ironic. Here's some ironic. Go okay, I got, a, I, I got a text, right? You know what the text is? Well, it's not a text. It's like a, it's like a, um, a Twitter um, a response to my phone. Speaking of the devil, uh, Taika Waititi is being courted to develop a Star Wars movie. Whoa. <laughs> That's crazy. Damn. They're putting out reaches for everyone. Actually, do you know what? This is the last thing I was going to say about the thing. Mm. Is that basically, I, I, I also read that maybe this got taken, you know, Disney bought fucking Fox. Yeah. So so they got yeah. Fox Searchlight, didn't they? Because this was a Fox Searchlight yes. film. Fox Searchlight, yeah, absolutely. So some theories think that actually it was a slightly different film um, from what Taika was originally going to make and it got slightly Disney-fied. What? So, and I was like, I don't think that's you, the point. Have you ever seen you know, any of his other films, which have like that's what I'm trying to say? You know, yes. And um, and, and like, I was like, I don't think this has been Disneyfied, really. Uh, Listen, yeah. if you watch the interview with Taika, he says, "I can never, I can't do a serious movie. I can't do 100. That's not me. I need some. It's like I get to. He's like, I, I like to do. Ser- I like to have a serious subject, but I can't do it without humor. That's his thing. It's like that's my voice. If you watch the interview with Taika Waititi, he's he takes the piss out of everything. He makes fun of himself. He'll make fun of you, but in a joyful way. He's not a malicious guy to make fun of you. But he likes to have fun. But at the same time, he wants to have a he wants to have some kind of message to go along with it, right there. So I'm I'm assuming that Thor: Love and Thunder, you're going to see a goofy ass Christian Bale. You're going to see Christian Bale probably like never seen him before and stuff like that. But for him, to, for people to say Disney fights, like watch Tiger's body of work. Tell me where he got serious, please. Even the Mandalorian episode he did had humor in it. Come on now. We still don't have Disney wow. Plus in the UK or the Mandalorian. <laughs> no, no, it's another two months for us. <laughs> Jesus, wow. <laughs> There's something going on. Fuck knows what's going on. I think we're already being Brexited from like freaking films and st- Oh, God, it's Jesus. Mm. Anyway, I tell you all what, right. um, I think that that's, that's pretty much all we've got time for, to be honest. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. That was, that was an interesting one. There's so many talking points about that film. Wow. 
but yeah, definitely um, check us out on Twitter at Podcast Rebels or uh, on Facebook at Transatlantic Rebels Podcast. So it's goodbye from Rashad and it's goodbye from me. Peace. Thank you.